The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our series, Key Battles in the Revolutionary War. Like last episode, we're not talking about a key battle in this episode. We've gone on a sidetrack. We're looking at what's happening in Pennsylvania from 1777 to 1778. And there are a lot of things happening at this time. The Americans have to abandon their capital, Philadelphia, because the British threaten it, and then they eventually take over it. There are massacres happening. We left our Continental Army in Valley Forge in the previous episode, and there are many fears that the army is going to fall apart and what's going to happen with the British right next to Congress, almost able to um, basically move in and completely take over the core of the colony. So the winter is ending. Things are thawing. It is moving into spring. So what happens next, James? All right. Well, let's talk about the enemies of George Washington. We touched on that in our last episode. There's a lot of grumbling. People are getting impatient. They're beginning to feel like Washington is not the great commander that they'd hoped he would be. He keeps losing. Uh, they, they, they seem to have forgotten about, <laughs> about Trenton and Princeton. Oh, that was yesterday. What have you done for me lately? So um, the Congress reconstituted the Board of War. We haven't really talked about this, but it's an oversight committee. Uh, the point is to be a layer between the Continental Congress and the Continental Army. And they appoint Horatio Gates as its head. And I'm sure Washington was thrilled to hear that. <laughs> Yay. Gates, in turn, created an officer of inspector general, and he planned a new campaign to Canada that was going to be commanded by Lafayette. Uh, but his real ambition was to gain Washington's position. We've talked about that at least a couple times, how Gates and also Charles Lee, who we've mentioned before, both really felt like they should have Washington's job. They were professionals. They were longtime soldiers, whereas Washington really wasn't. Gates tried to nominate a man named Thomas Conway as inspector general. Conway had been one of the main anti-Washington agitators. Well, Washington learned about this conspiracy. Uh, it's kind of funny. He he read a letter that it wasn't he wasn't supposed to read, and it talked about all this. Um, and he wrote to Henry Lawrence again. That's the father of John Lawrence. Henry Lawrence is the president of the Continental Congress at the time. He asked that Nathaniel Green be made quartermaster general, and Lawrence granted that request. So again, as we mentioned last time, Green is going to step in and do a much better job of getting supplies for the Continental Army as any of the predecessors. General Gates wrote a letter to Washington denying that he had anything against Washington. Of course, he's lying through his teeth, but <laughs> Conway resigned from the Army. And there's a lot more to this than that, but we don't have time to go into all the details. So basically, it was really a conspiracy that never really got off the ground. It was just a bunch of people hoping to, you know, wishing, hoping, <laughs> crying, waiting, hoping, as Buddy Holly once sang. But, um, and then Washington obtained the appointment of General Wilhelm von Steuben. And he came to Washington. Uh, he was came from Germany. He had a, a letter of recommendation from, who was it that wrote the letter? Was it Benjamin Franklin? I can't remember, but... He had an inflated resume. He claimed he had been a baron who served on Frederick the Great's personal staff. So Frederick the Great, this great <laughs> butt-kicking, conquering king, he says, oh, I was I was lieutenant general on staff of uh, Frederick the Great, except he didn't say it in English because <laughs> he didn't know any English. But anyway, Steuben made all that up. He had really been just a captain. So we'll talk a little bit more about him, but Scott, you wanted to talk some more about the conspirators? Yeah, I, I just love all these freebooters who show up in wartime, Lafayette. Sometimes you can get someone who's good. Other times you get people that you really don't know what their credentials are. And my historical hunch is that there's probably a book out there of about all these fake freebooters who would claim that, oh yeah, I am a 
Italian count. I am related to the Medici family when it's a complete and total imposter who shows up and who may have gotten command at some point. So I've read a couple of books on imposters and the sort of like the guy in the Catch Me If You Can movie. Oh, yeah. Whatever that guy's name is who assumed multiple personas. Abernacki, I think that's it. Uh, oh, I thought it was Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I'm confused too. <laughs> but um, all that to say, Frank Abernacki personas are by no means constricted to the 20th century imposters and are all sorts of times. So I'm sure there's a book out there. Listeners, if you know of that, please let us know. I would love to see that. But before getting too far off track, I just want to mention some other things with conspirators. The conspirators are sort of like the American domestic version of these foreign freebooters who come and inflate their resume. They're trying to jockey for position in whatever way they can, because at the start of a young nation, there's incredible opportunity that if this project is successful, could give them incredible offices and prestige. So Gates conspires with Conway, and there's other people like Dr. Benjamin Rush, General Thomas Mifflin, other members of Congress. I'm almost positive Charles Lee would have been part of this conspiracy. He was unfortunately in jail at the time still. Yeah, it's kind of hard to get too involved. We'll talk later that he's working some other angles that some people are suspicious of while he's there. But Rush's criticism of Washington in a letter he wrote to Patrick Henry was typical of what was being said. He wrote, The Northern Army has shown us what Americans are capable of doing with a general at their head. Ooh. Yes. Washington doesn't count. The book that I got that from uh, has general in all caps. I don't know if that was in the original letter for effect or not. But then it continues. The spirit of the Southern Army is no ways inferior to the spirit of the Northern. A Gates, a Lee, or a Conway would in a few weeks render them an irresistible body of men. So he is saying that Washington is the weak link in the entire war effort. And I just thought I'd throw that in because we like these uh, counterintuitive facts of those who don't know as much about the war. But anyway, getting back to our freebooters, our German friend von Steuben, how is he? Is he all he's cracked up to be or not? Yeah, so he comes in with this fake resume and saying he was this really high commander in the army of Frederick the Great when he really wasn't. But that doesn't mean he wasn't good at what he did. He had a talent for training. And he was exactly what the doctor ordered. He was exactly what Washington needed. He arrives at Washington's camp in Valley Forge in February of 1778. And he is like a drill sergeant. He standardizes drilling and training. He creates a model company and turns them into an outstanding unit. This is despite uh, having almost no English. He did speak French. And so Uh, The way he was able to communicate with the soldiers is he would give orders in French and either John Lawrence or Alexander Hamilton would or some other officer who knew French would translate from French to English. Um, It was really funny. I don't (laughs) just an anecdote about von Steuben. He had this terrible temper and everybody who's seen any movies, military movies with drill sergeants, you know, drill sergeants are famous for their tempers and yelling at people. Oh, you're the worst ever. Get out and give me 50 right now. Dog face and all that. So kind of think about that, but in German, (laughs) (laughs) he would start just, uh, swearing. He would let loose a a blue streak of profanities. And, And of course, Washington hated profanity. Washington tried to outlaw it on more than one occasion, but, uh, he let it slide this time. First of all, he didn't probably didn't understand it because it was in German or French, neither of which Washington spoke. But so, von Steuben would just fly into a rage and let loose all these swear words in, uh, you know, in German and French, and even some in English that he'd picked up along the way. And and this actually, rather than make the soldiers scared or mad, it made them laugh. <laughs> <laughs> comic relief, which I know is not what von Steuben intended, but but he developed a really good relationship with his uh, with the Continental soldiers that he was training. Even though he was tough and would yell at them and curse at them, they would laugh and they would they just re- they appreciated what he was doing and they they realized that he was making them better soldiers and more and a more effective army. Uh, before long. Other companies adopted von Steuben's training method, and by the next spring, the Continental Army was a much more professional army. So they go in 
When they went into Valley Forge, they were very much still an amateur force. They had improved, as we, as we talked about, but they can, they're going to come out of Valley Forge. Valley Forge is going to be a forge of character for them. It's going to be a forge of their discipline and their fighting ability. So von Steuben, uh, like Lafayette, is going to be one of the good foreigners, You know, one of the useful foreigners. We've also talked about Pulaski, uh, Thaddeus Kosciusko, if I said his name right. He was big help at Saratoga. So not all of the foreigners that came over were just jockeying for position and, and money and glory and all that. Some of them actually did a good job, and von Steuben was, was one of them. All right, that's the closing the book for now on von Steuben. He's actually going to go on to do some commanding later, but that'll be in the future. And also, just a thing for him as a uh, Prussian military officer, him claiming that he was part of the staff of Frederick the Great makes perfect sense because – before Napoleon becomes the patron saint of military strategy, that was what Frederick the Great was, that he turned Prussia into this, basically the absolute summit and apex of modern military techniques. So for many decades afterwards, if you have someone like von Steuben or others who want to seek their fortune abroad, if you have the identity of a Prussian military officer other nations that are working furiously to modernize their military will gladly accept oppression into their ranks. This is what happens at the same time and many years later in the Ottoman Empire when they're also working furiously to reform their army. The classical methods no longer work and they need regiments and modern system, modern drilling. You need drilling in order to be able to execute these techniques. And when everyone gets obsessed with Napoleon in the next century, then you have to have better regimentation to be able to do all these Highly complex maneuvers in order to train well. You need someone. Who do you get to train them? You get a Prussian. So von Steuben is sort of the early part of this uh, Prussian wave that's going to strike all these different parts of the world. Yes, indeed. Who was it that said that Prussia was an army in need of a nation? <laughs> right. Most na All other nations were in need of an army. It was an army in need of a nation. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember the source of that quote, but yeah, the Prussians were famous for their martial prowess, just like the Hessians. All right, so where does the next stage take us? Okay, so we've gone through the winter of 1777-78. Now we're coming to the spring of 78. We talked about in our last episode uh, how in the, the toward the end of 1777, General Howe submitted his resignation. Well, finally in April, after he's had countless parties <laughs> and countless balls and countless, uh, you know, well – sessions with his lover and <laughs> we'll just put it that way uh finally in april of 1778 he got word that his resignation was accepted <laughs> oh yes that resignation you sent us several months ago <laughs> we'll take it you're out of there so he left in may of 1778 and he was replaced by henry clinton henry clinton is now the third british commander of all british forces in north america so let's sketch him out a little bit let's talk about clinton do a mini biography here Clinton's father was a British admiral who became governor of New York, where he and the young Henry moved in 1743 when Clinton was 13. He lived in New York until he was 19. So he, was, he knew the colonies, and particularly New York. Clinton became an army officer in 1746. He fought in Germany during the Seven Years' War. Who knows, maybe he fought against von Steuben. <laughs> I think von Steuben might have been a little younger, but I can't remember exactly when he was born. It doesn't matter. While Henry Clinton was in the Seven Years' War in Europe, he met Charles Lee, William Alexander, who goes by the name Lord Sterling. He's, he uh, became one of Washington's most trusted subordinates. We've talked about him before. And he also met Charles Cornwallis. So this is kind of like a – not a reunion because it happens before the Revolutionary Era. A pre-union? Can you have a pre-union? <laughs> I don't know. This is kind of a, a proving ground for – for several future commanders in the American Revolutionary War, just like the French and Indian War was on the continent, on the American continent. By 1772, Clinton had risen to the rank of Major General, and he came to Boston in 1775 along with William Howe and John Burgoyne. So again, there's that trio of Major Generals who came over to help General Gage out, and now he is the last one that we've mentioned to be put in a major position of authority. We've, obviously, we've talked a lot about how we've talked quite a bit about Burgoyne. Now it's Clinton's turn to shine, or maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> He's going to try. Clinton was ordered to leave Philadelphia and return to New York. 
it was considered to be a safer place to be, particularly with the possibility of the French fleet on its way. So 1,500 loyalist families in Philadelphia decided to flee with the British Army. You know, and Scott, you can't help feel just a little sorry for the loyalists, uh, even though we would, from the perspective of the Americans, they were on the wrong side. But think of these people, most of these loyalists, uh, or at least a good chunk of them, had been born in America, raised in America, and now they find themselves on the wrong side of, of you know, quote unquote wrong. I'm not using that in, as a judgmental term, but they're they're on the side of the British, and so when the British pull out of Philadelphia, they have no choice but to get out of there. And a lot of them are leaving their homes behind. They're leaving most of their possessions behind. They're leaving their life behind, and they're going to have to start an entirely new life somewhere else where they're not familiar with. So I do feel a little bit sorry for the loyalists. Yeah, and let's not forget that from the perspective of many of these people, a lot of them are probably just biding their time, seeing who's going to be successful, and then casting in their lot with the winning army because they simply want to go back to their lives and go on as they did before. Oh, the British are winning? Uh, Sure, we're loyalists uh, just because we want to keep our life and property. It's not as if every single person in the colonies is getting fired up by rousing speeches in a Philadelphia or Boston tavern and personally heard Patrick Henry speak. Many people did feel that fire and passion, but many people didn't. They were simply trying to live their lives. And what happens if you cast your lot in the British. Oh, yeah, they're they're moving on Philadelphia. And then you see that the army is retreating. If you're left behind, everyone knew you to be a loyalist. Maybe you would be marked for treason. Maybe you're worried that your goods would be taken by the military. You don't know what is going to happen. And many would have been loyalists for ideological reasons, but maybe many others wouldn't. So that is a good point to make. Exactly. And the loyalists saw themselves as the good guys. You know, they said, hey, we're loyal to the king. We're loyal to the sovereign of this colonies. He is our ruler, and we're going to stick with him. You guys are a bunch of rebels. You're the ones that are rebelling against God's anointed ruler. So, Yeah, you're the Confederate Army, the Confederate States of America, if we want to look at it that way. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, really tough place for them to be in. We we saw earlier that a lot of loyalists fled Boston back in early 1776 when the British left Boston because they were surrounded by the Continentals. And here it is again, a repeated situation. It's going to happen all over the country, and especially when the war is over. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. Getting back here to uh, Clinton and his army, word that the British were planning to leave Philadelphia reached Washington at Valley Forge as early as May, and he was joined by Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold comes to help Washington out. That's good for Washington, at least at this point. Benedict Arnold has recovered somewhat from his wounds. He's he's never going to be the same again. We saw that he's he got shot in the leg during the attack on Quebec, and then he got uh, shot in the same place, and was his horse fell down and pinned him. And he, so, but Benedict Arnold's leg was never going to be the same, and it ends up being I think it was two inches shorter than the leg that was good. Uh, but Benedict Arnold is there to help out Washington, and then Washington gets Charles Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Yeah, I know. Oh boy. Thanks, guys. He had been a British prisoner for 18 months, as Scott mentioned earlier. You didn't mention the 18 months part, but he'd been a prisoner for a long time. And Charles Lee, this guy, a a man, while he was a prisoner of the British, he gave advice to the (laughs) British. He actually said, well, you know, if I was going to, in in your shoes, I would attack Washington here and I would do this and do this and go to this town. And can you imagine that? (laughs) I mean, I don't... we actually did a discussion of this in, in my 
Facebook group, American History Fanatics, and and somebody posed the question: Was Charles Lee a traitor? And uh, most people, the general consensus was not on the scale that Benedict Arnold would go on to be. But but I mean, you're giving advice to the British now. I don't know. He might have been giving them bad advice. He might have been trying to throw them off or just telling them what they wanted to hear just to improve his situation as a captive. Who knows? Maybe he was just biding his time and thought, okay, if things go really bad for America, I can, you know, find somebody who I knew was a friend while I was in captivity. I'm just speculating here. That's a good point. He might have been just trying to play the odds and just hedge his bets, so to speak, and make sure that if he's going to, if if the British lose, he he might end up in a better position if he helps him out a little bit. So I'm sure Washington was just thrilled to see Charles Lee. So anyway, the British are packing up. They're leaving Philadelphia on June 12th. This is 1778. Clinton marched the army across the Delaware River and across New Jersey. Charles Lee advised Washington not to pursue Clinton's army. <laughs> and you know Washington, Washington likes to um, attack when he can. He's an aggressive general, but again, he doesn't make foolhardy, stupid attacks. Lee says, don't do this. It's not going to go well. Uh, Washington said, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. And he decided to hit Clinton's rear guard. And then he makes a big mistake here. Well, again, Washington really, uh, he, I don't know why he did this. He put Lee in charge of the operation. <laughs> So it's you're scratching your head, George. What are you What are you thinking here? Charles Lee just said he he didn't think this was a good idea. He didn't want to attack. Great. Now go lead an attack on him. I mean, you know his heart's not going to be in it. It's like it's like uh, Longstreet at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, General Lee gave Longstreet overall command of the attack on the second day and the third day, and Longstreet didn't want to do it. And some historians have said that Longstreet purposely dogged it, at least on day two. But anyway, that, I don't want to get too far off. Go listen to the Civil War series, folks, if you haven't already. But um, after you're done with this one. <laughs> of course. So anyway, so George Washington puts Charles Lee, I think he was kind of still a little bit in awe of Lee. I, he, he knew Lee was a professional soldier. And he, I guess he figured even though he's not really, his heart's not in it, he's a professional. He'll go get the job done. So we'll see about that. Um, the attack force caught up with the British under Cornwallis. Uh, Cornwallis is at this point is basically Clinton's second in command. They kept, they catch up to the British. The continental army does near Monmouth courthouse on June 28th. Charles Lee in overall field command sends Anthony Wayne. There he is again, mad Anthony with part of the army to attack the tail of the army while he led the rest around Cornwallis's flank to try to cut them off. An another attempted flanking movement. Lee discovered that Cornwallis had many more soldiers than he had thought. <laughs> he gets around there, oh my gosh, look at all these guys. Cornwallis, finally realizing what's going on, that he's, the Americans are nipping at his heels, he says, all right, you want to fight? <laughs> you got it. So he turns around and he attacks Lee and the Americans are driven back. Lee orders a retreat, or at least uh, supposedly he ordered a retreat. Washington, back behind the main force somewhat, he sees these, these troops retreating, and he's not real wild about retreating. He's riding forward, he, and he saw Lee himself retreating. He runs into Lee on the battlefield, and he goes up to Lee, and he and he. he almost loses his temper again. He says, what does this mean, sir? Give me instantly an explanation of this retreat. And Lee was just completely caught off guard. <laughs> he, he was just gobsmacked or he, huh? Uh, uh, you know how sometimes somebody surprises you and you just, you don't know what to say. Uh, uh, uh. So Lee, all Lee could get out of his mouth was, sir, sir, Washington demanded, why are you retreating? And Lee replied because the contradictory reports brought about a confusion that I could not control. That's a good excuse. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The last thing you want to admit or say, if you're a commander is I couldn't control it. I'm not in control here is what he's basically saying. Well, that's, you definitely don't say that to George Washington. And he also mentioned, Oh, by the way, I did advise against this attack. 
Washington told Lee he should not have even taken the command. Why did you take the command if you didn't believe in the attack? They, actually, Washington had almost given it to Lafayette, but because then Lee said, no, I'll do it after all. But anyway, so he doesn't get it done. Lee doesn't get the job done. I don't know if Lee could have done a whole lot, really, with the whole British Army turning and beginning to engage. Washington is really tough on him. But again, Lee, at least it seems Lee fails. He doesn't do the best he possibly could. Washington took personal command of the army, and he deployed it in a strong defensive position. And again, listener, you'll have to get a map. I don't want to go into much detail about the physical terrain. Clinton and Cornwallis counterattacked, but the Americans did not give way. The British fell back. So uh, so it's not exactly a big uh, victory for the Americans, but once again, we see the Americans fighting well, not going into a rout, you know, not running for their lives. They're standing their ground. They're retreating once, once Washington rallied the troops. Uh, they're retreating in an organized manner. Um, very slowly holding their ground as best they can, and the British fell back. So it's kind of a draw, kind of a stalemate. Now, I want to mention a side story. This is a fun fact. The the legend of Molly Pitcher. (laughs) Molly Pitcher. Molly Pitcher's real name was Mary Ludwig Hayes. She was a camp follower whose job was to bring water to artillerymen, but who in this battle helped fire a cannon. If I remember the story correctly, her I think one version of the story says that she was helping her husband and her husband was wounded and couldn't fire the, the cannon. So she just took over and fired it herself. It's a, it's a great story. Who knows what, how much truth there is in it. It ought to be true. If it's not true, one of those things, like some of the quotes we've mentioned, but it could be true. So we'll leave it at that. It could be true. Yeah. Maybe there was a lady who named Molly Pitcher or later named that, you know, a lot of these stories pop up many years after the event. But one thing that's definitely true is that many men on both sides in this battle died of heat stroke or exhaustion. The temperature was nearly 100 degrees. So, uh, yeah, really hot. And, of course, they're wearing these thick uniforms. Well, at least the British are. (laughs) I don't know how many Americans had full uniform. Not very many. The battle was kind of a stalemate, kind of technically a loss for the Americans because they're, the British are going to get away. They're going to continue. The Americans didn't stop the march back to Philadelphia. But again, the Americans fought well. Washington claimed it as a victory, although the British got away. You know, he could say, hey, we weren't destroyed. We weren't totally destroyed and driven from the field. Uh, we held our ground as best we could, but the British got away. Meanwhile, after the battle, Charles Lee was court-martialed, he was, and he was found guilty of incompetence, disobedience, and insolence. That's the real victory here in this battle of Lee's court-martial. We get to say goodbye to Charles Lee. Uh, oh, man, I, I can't stand this guy. But, uh, he, so he's going to spend the rest of his life taking care of his dogs, his many dogs. Um, he actually doesn't live that long. but So... That's the end of Charles Lee, at least his military career. The casualties, uh, 400 to 500 for the Americans. The British, we have no idea. Estimates go anywhere from 230 to 1,000. So perhaps if you put it somewhere in the middle, that would be about 600. So roughly equal casualties, a little bit more for the British. But once again, uh, Washington fails to achieve his aim, which was to at least slow down, if not stop the British march back to New York. I said Philadelphia a minute ago. I'm sorry, they're leaving Philadelphia and they're heading to New York. Uh, Scott, I think you wanted to talk a little bit more about Charles. Do we have to, can we just not talk about Charles? <laughs> just, just pretend he doesn't exist at all. Yeah, you've got some more information about him possibly being a traitor. It's not so much information, but kind of like your discussion in American History Fanatics, I've read speculation that his performance was so poor that he could only have been a traitor, that he was trying to single-handedly bring about a disastrous defeat by ordering retreat at the first chance, and that this proves that Lee was a traitor and he'd been turned during his captivity. I don't quite buy that theory just because if you're going to be a traitor, what Benedict Arnold does make sense, where you would, and where other people have done, you simply cross enemy lines. Lee could have very easily have done that, um, the British perhaps could have released him and he could have provided intelligence for different things for 
him to be a mole in a command position and for him to play this game of three dimensional chess, there's nothing that he's done during this war to show that he's as smart or as capable of doing something like that. Yeah, so, no kidding. So I forget the quote of do not ascribe to malice what can be explained by incompetence. And that what I would say is, according to Occam's razor, perhaps a better explanation for Charles Lee. So I agree with you, Scott. I don't see him as being some kind of devious mastermind. Yeah, he's purposely dogging it. I think he just he just wasn't a very good commander. Mm-hmm. He said himself, I'm not in control, basically. There's a confusion I could not control. Anyway, so let's talk about the aftermath of the battle. This is the Battle of Monmouth, by the way. So uh, last time we talked about Brandywine and Germantown, which were attempts by Washington to stop the British from getting to Philadelphia from New York. This was an attempt by Washington to harass them as they were the British were moving from Philadelphia back to New York. Uh, but anyway, the British Army reached New York City in early July. Washington reached the outskirts of New York City on July 6th. Again, this is 1778. Uh, for the next three years, the Continental Army occupied several forts around New York City, which was essentially under siege. So it's similar to the situation around Boston, except the American position was not nearly as strong. Uh, Nevertheless, we're not going to see tons of action. Washington would fight no major battles for the next three years, uh, nor would the British. There'll be some minor engagements. There'll be some raids. There'll be fights with some of the Indians. But essentially, the Northern War settles down into a stalemate where neither side really does a whole lot. So there's not going to be any more Saratogas or Trenton or Princeton or Bunker Hill or anything like that. Uh, the war is going to shift to the South. And for his conduct, we already saw at Monmouth, Charles Lee was court-martialed. <laughs> he was suspended. Let's, talk, let's just keep talking about Charles Lee. Let's beat a man while he's down, Charles Lee. He was court-martialed and suspended for a year. Okay. I thought I, I lied earlier. I said we were done with Charles Lee. Cross my fingers. I think this is the last we will really talk about Charles Lee. <laughs> well, I'll say one final thing as sort of an epilogue to his story. It's a fitting end, I guess, whatever your thoughts are on him. Uh, so he's court martialed on charges of disobedience, of disorders, misbehavior before the enemy, and disrespect to the commander in chief. He's found guilty. He lobbied Congress to overturn the verdict, but no one really took up his cause. And then he makes a series of written and oral attacks on Washington to try to denigrate him in the public eye and launch a media campaign. That also fails, and that alienates most of his supporters, so he doesn't have people in society that will back him up. And it caused him to be challenged to a number of duels, which... Oh, yeah, the duel. We should talk about the duel. Yeah, well, if you have uh, that in mind, by all means, yes. Oh, well, it was... uh... Uh, I believe was it John Lawrence? It, John or, Lawrence, yeah. yeah. John Lawrence challenged him to a duel. This is in the Hamilton musical. They talk about, there's a song called The Ten Duel Commandments. Uh, really fun song. Yeah, Washington was not happy about that. I, I believe if Lee was wounded, not seriously, not like mortally wounded or anything, but he was wounded. Lawrence was sticking up for Washington. He was another one of these young men that Washington took onto his staff, along with Lafayette and Hamilton and Lawrence didn't appreciate what Lee had to say about Washington. So he is wounded and then he licks his wounds for the rest of his life and withdraws from public life in disgrace. Yeah. Yeah. Charles Lee, he's not going to live a whole lot longer. Just kind of a sad ending, I guess, to a guy that you would have hoped had better potential, but he just had more, a lot more ambition than he had talent. He just didn't have the talent to back up all this ambition. Yeah, had he come into the public scene maybe a decade or two later, he might have been a good politician. Yeah, probably. So he, he's going to die in 1782. So this is before the war even officially ends. He'll be 50 years old. So, hey, I outlived Charles Lee. Yay. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. That's something to be proud of for whatever reason. All right. Well, here we go. This uh, sidetrack episode, I guess, how would you sum it up, James, for Pennsylvania that there's, I would say progress was made. The overall war aims, America hasn't secured itself a stronger position, but Pennsylvania is no longer under direct threat. The army is better trained. If this is going to be a war of attrition, then they have better fundamentals than the British. So that's how I understand. But how do you see this year that went by? 
I think of it as a moral victory uh, for the Americans and re- more than a moral victory in several ways. If you think about it, how left General Howe left New York and went to Philadelphia, he wanted to capture the Congress, or at least as, as many of the members as he could. He hoped to snag people, I guess, like John Adams and Samuel Adams and those people and string them up, you know, maybe make an example. And maybe if he could do that, then a lot of the other rebel leaders would see the handwriting on the wall and give up. Well, he got to Philadelphia. The Congress was gone. He stayed in Philadelphia for a while and then eventually just had to leave and go back to New York. Although, of course, it was Clinton by that time. But so really, I think the overall British objective was foiled. I mean, it, the, the overall British objective certainly wasn't, oh, let's go to Philadelphia and hang out for a year and a half or so, or a year, <laughs> a year, and then let's just go right back to New York and, and settle down into a stalemate and do nothing else at all for the rest of the war, at least in the North. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I think the American army could be proud of itself. And, and again, we, as you mentioned, they get better. Their Their fighting ability seems to be improving gradually. They've been whipped into shape. They're really becoming a professional army, thanks in large part to Baron von Steuben. So, yeah, I think it's uh, things are starting to look up a little bit for the Americans, even though they didn't win a great victory in a battle like Washington had hoped to. At least they didn't lose. They didn't get crushed. They didn't get wiped out. They're still alive to fight another day, and they're stronger for it. Yeah, well, I think that's a good way to sum it up. So in the next episode, we're going to be going back into our main battles that compose this top 10 key battles of the Revolutionary War. We're going to go to Rhode Island. So we'll dive into all that in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com we will find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of Madeira and raise a toast to liberty. <laughs>